Good evening, everybody. I'm your host, Jordan Jenna. And I'm your forecaster, Christopher Tate. We have a lot going on on this week's weather or not. How's the weather looking? This weekend, looking a little bit on the chilly side. Temperatures expected to be below average for this time of year. We may also see a little bit of snow on Friday. Otherwise, should be a sunny weekend, if not chilly. Mm, not excited about the colder temperatures, but the sunshine will stay. For the rest of the episode, we have some stories about California wildfires how they continue to impact throughout the fire season, as well as Mike has a feature for us on how frost impacts crops. Up next, Nature in the News. Recent California fires, which have just been contained this past Monday, have been burning for the past two weeks, causing families to flee from their homes. Throughout the course of these California fires, there have been as many as 16 fires occurring. Additionally, planned blackouts throughout the state of California relinquished all access to power for residents in hopes of relieving the fires from spreading even furthermore. Intentional blackouts were never used as a strategy planned before, and they actually haven't been helping much. But what we don't know is, surprisingly, the fires in California have been less destructive this year than in previous fire seasons. For example, last year at this time, there were 600,000 acres already burned. Throughout that year, there have been thousands of homes ruined and 86 people have died. This past May, YouTube content creator James Mr. Beast Donaldson reached 20 million subscribers on the video sharing platform. As he was approaching this milestone, he was struggling to find a clever way to celebrate. The internet managed to find one for him, plant one tree for every subscriber he has on YouTube. Donaldson accepted the challenge and made a fundraiser out of it. He encouraged other well-known YouTube channels to start their own branch of the fundraiser, and other high-profile individuals like SpaceX's Elon Musk got involved. People could donate a tree for just one dollar, and as of Wednesday night, Donaldson, his friends, and the community have raised enough money to plant 14.2 million trees. All of the donations go to the Arbor Day Foundation, which will identify areas that are in greatest need of reforestation or noise reduction and send the majority of the trees to those areas, hoping to help reduce the impact of greater carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere. Although most of October seemed to be hotter than usual with above average temperatures throughout the beginning of the month, November is predicted to be much of a different story. In the east, several cities had their hottest Octobers on record, whereas in cities in the northwestern parts of the country, they experienced colder than average temperatures. Cities that broke the record for the hottest October include Miami, Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, and Tallahassee, Florida. And additionally, cities in Georgia, as well as Gatlinburg, Tennessee. On the flip side, the west had much colder than average temperatures, with cities in the west experiencing the coldest October on average. Now looking ahead to November, temperatures will most likely balance themselves out, meaning temperatures in our area for the most of the eastern parts of the United States are predicted to be below average for the month of November. In 2014, the National Weather Service began their Weather Ready Nation initiative. The program, run by Weather Ready Nation ambassadors, encourages public discussion about how best to prepare for severe weather events and what to do in the aftermath of them. This year, the National Weather Service welcomed their 10,000th ambassador, the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Company. The Weather Ready Nation program fosters relationships between federal, state, and local governments, nonprofits, small businesses and large corporations, and the private sector, all oriented around making sure people are well prepared when adverse weather arrives. Since the program's inception, the National Weather Service has noted several positive benefits, including a drop in the, severe, in the number of severe weather fatalities, particularly from lightning and storm surge, and the public's awareness about threats posed by severe weather. Our weekend forecast takes you through a very dry but fairly cold 
weekend here in central Pennsylvania. Let's show you the setup. Starting on Friday, we have a little bit of light snow that could be prevalent across the western half of the state and especially on into the interior northeast. But on the back side of that, mostly sunny skies will take charge over most of Pennsylvania as a high pressure system builds in out of the lower Ohio Valley. It's going to be a beautiful day on Saturday, but it is going to be a little bit on the cool side. And then on Sunday, we have some clouds starting to build in as a rain shield starts to move in out of the north associated with a low pressure system in Canada. For your forecast on Friday, a high only of 33 degrees. It's going to be a very chilly day under a partly cloudy sky. Friday night going to be fairly cold as well cooling down to 25 degrees and then for your Saturday another chiller 35 degrees for the high so just a touch warmer again under a partly cloudy sky and then as we step through the day on Sunday we do expect some clouds to start to build in in advance of that rain which should be arriving Monday into Tuesday a high around 47 degrees up next Mike Susco has a feature on how frost impacts crops Last weekend, the National Weather Service issued a freeze warning for a large area of Pennsylvania. Now, it's not uncommon for temperatures to drop below freezing this time of year here in Pennsylvania, but there is one big difference between now versus next month and into February, and that is the growing season. During the grow growing season, frost can form when temperatures drop cold enough and it can damage or even destroy the crops, costing the economy millions of dollars on an annual basis. Now, how does the agriculture handle this risk that they have to deal with every year? Let's head over to Harner Farms here in State College to find out. Well, frost, you know, it happens a lot in the spring and a lot in the fall. So, uh, what it does, anything that's tender, you know, your tender annuals and patients, any of your flowers, uh, tomatoes, eggplant, any of that stuff that's just an annual. Uh, when it frosts, if it's hard enough, can, you know, either damage the crop significantly or the fruit or uh, kill it if it's, you know, severe enough. As crops continue to grow throughout the season, their tolerance to temporary harsh conditions in their environment may change. When it comes to frost, the springtime is the more concerning than the fall because of the delicate state of the plants. For us, you know, we grow a lot of apples, so, and peaches and plums and stuff. So in the spring, when they're in bloom, you know, that's the most critical time. So if you get a frost at that time, you can lose your entire crop, which has happened, you know, a few times for us. And then uh, you gotta scramble and come up with uh, <laughs> other stuff to do. To help lower the risk of crop damage, farmers will try to wait to plant their crops until a certain date. This date can vary as the growing season changes for different areas of Pennsylvania and the entire country depending on the climate for that specific area. So here in State College, Pennsylvania, you know, we don't like to plant anything uh, in the ground uh, before Memorial Day. Uh, we've had frost as late as uh, maybe May 30th and uh, that time of year, it can affect the Christmas trees because they're just starting to bud out, freeze that all off, and uh, you can use it, lose that year's growth. Uh, the grapes got hit real hard that year. The good news is, is that there are different ways to protect the crops from frost should the temperatures drop low enough overnight. Uh, there are ways to protect your crop. You can cover it. You know, there's floating row covers, blankets, whatever you have. If you have nice flowers at home, just get a blanket and throw it over it, bring it inside, and take it outside the next morning. In the spring, we don't do it here, but you know, a lot of guys use irrigation because when that ice freezes, it creates a little uh, insulation for those apple buds and it won't get below 32 degrees and it can save your crop that way. Frost is not the only problem that the agricultural community will have to deal with early or late in the growing season. Snowfall in the early fall or late in the spring can also become a major problem for anyone who has crops or plants outside. Well, if getting early snow, first of all, it keeps us out of the field. Uh, if we're doing corn, corn maize, it's big for us. It can knock that down and, and destroy that. Uh, we're still picking apples, usually in the mid, late October. And uh, if you get a heavy enough snow, it can you know, knock the apples off the tree. According to the National Weather Service, 36 degrees is the magic number for frost to form, but that does not mean the crops will take a serious hit. It is when the temperatures drop below freezing into the 20s where the damage can be a real problem. In the spring, it's 28. If it gets below 28, you expect significant damage. And a lot of it has to do with how long the frost is. 
you know, uh, if it's just a couple hours, you know, you might see a little damage, but if it's, uh, you know, you know, long duration cost, like eight hours or something like that, you, know, you can see your damage numbers go up. And even though some of the fruit may make it, it can get damaged, you know, at that stage. And, you know, it's not saleable in the end. As the growing season finishes up here in Pennsylvania, the risk for frost damaging the crops will go down. But don't forget to bring those sensitive plants inside when the temperatures drop below 32 overnight. For whether or not, I'm Mike Suska. Our extended forecast will take us into the second full week of November, but before we get there, let's take a quick recap of your weekend forecast. Friday, just a few morning flurries in the area, a high only around 33 degrees. That is gradually going to be warming up as we progress through the weekend, 35 on Saturday and 47 on Sunday. Sunday clouds are on the increase in advance of a little rainmaker that may be arriving on Monday. After that though, temperatures are going to fall fairly quickly. Your average high for this time of year is 42 and we're not even going to break the 40 degree mark. Uh, Monday going to be in the mid 30s and then temperatures falling back into the mid and upper 20s for your high temperatures. I couldn't rule out the possibility of some single digit lows and certainly some low teens. Thankfully though as we head into the latter half of the week we will be seeing a little bit of sun so Jordan even though it's going to be fairly cold outside we will have a little bit of sun to balance things out. Yes, but that sun's not going to last for long. No, it's not. Sunset's now before 5 p.m. here in State College. Which brings us to our weather, weather whiz quiz question. And this week's question was, other than Arizona, which U.S. state does not observe daylight saving time? A. Hawaii, B. Utah, C. North Dakota, and D. Wisconsin. And if you were thinking A. Hawaii, then you would be correct. And actually, Hawaii has always never participated in daylight saving time. That is correct. Hawaii adopted a law that prevented them or that uh, kept them out of daylight savings time. Arizona stopped observing daylight savings time in the late 1960s. It's very interesting. So Indeed. Hawaii is very much not even close to us. And they don't participate in our daylight saving time. <laughs> all right. That's all we have time for on this week's episode of Whether or Not. I'm your host, Jordan Jenna. And I'm your forecaster, Christopher Tate. Have a nice night, everyone.